importantly, uh, I'm going to give it a title. Can I give you the message title now? I know you're holding your Bible, uh, but you can type this or write this down if you're taking notes. And I want you to look at someone and tell them these words. Tell them, my faith can be found. Tell them, can be found. Just say that again. My faith can be found. And if I were to give this a thought or a subtitle, Pastor CJ, here is the thought. I'm yet keeping on. And I just want you to say that. Just say, I'm yet keeping on. Just I'm going to give you a little country, old school term to carry with you through this week. Look at your neighbor and tell them, I'm yet keeping on. Look at Luke chapter number 18. Let's begin reading in verse number 1. In verse number 1. I'm reading from the New Living Translation of Scripture. Thank you, Brother Josiah, and thank you, Ben. Luke chapter number 1, the Scripture tells us that one day Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and that they should never give up. Look at your neighbor and tell them, never give up. Tell them, never give up, never give up. Here's the story that Jesus told them. Jesus said there was a judge in a certain city who neither feared God nor cared about people. A widow of that city came to him repeatedly, repeatedly. Everyone say repeatedly. And she said, give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. Some versions read, grant me justice against my adversary or over my adversary. And the judge ignored her for a while. But finally, he said to himself, I don't fear God. I don't care about people. But this woman, this woman. <laughs> you, know them, you know them little memes that, that you see a meme of a person and then you see somebody else re post the meme and they say that this is me this is me this is me this is me uh, 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 the judge said this woman but this woman look at your neighbor and tell him this is me this is me this is me this woman right here is driving me crazy <laughs> I know that there's not a man in this building that's ever said those words before <laughs> But he said it. He said it for us, Brother Johnny. This woman is driving. I almost called this message today. And I thought if I call it this, I'm going to get in so much trouble. This woman is driving me crazy. I almost called this message. This woman's driving me crazy. Um, yeah. <laughs> the judge said, I'm going to see that she gets her justice because she's wearing me out with her constant requests. And then the Lord said, then Jesus said, learn a lesson from this judge, from this judge. Even he rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think that God will surely, surely, surely give justice to his chosen people? Who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? Oh, Jesus, what are you telling us? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. But when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on the earth who have faith. Again, very shortly here, Elder Parler, we're going to preach, treat a message here entitled, My Faith Can Be Found. And I want you to say that with me. My faith can be found. And I want you to just shout with me, I'm yet keeping on. Just shout that. I'm yet keeping on. Set your Bibles down. Join hands quickly if you would father we thank you for your word father we thank you that man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from your mouth and father we ask you for our daily bread today we ask you for our sustenance during this season 
Father, I thank you that you are here to somehow miraculously with just five loaves and two fish feed all of us. You're about to break this down and you're about to feed each and every one of us. God, I don't know how you do it week after week, but we ask you to take what we have here and break it up and sustain us today and bring us back here next week walking in victory. And for that, we give you thanks in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen and amen. Let's put our hands together. Let's shout one more time. My faith can be found. My faith can be found. And then you may have your seat. Jesus is deep into his ministry by the time we get to Luke chapter number 18. Uh, Sister Marie, Jesus is deep into his ministry. And, and, and having said that, uh, the disciples are beginning to understand Jesus now to a certain degree, Brother Jesse, that they obviously did not understand early on. And you know the disciples walking with Jesus, Dr. B, uh, there was a lot that he had to teach them very quickly. Uh, uh, we know that, 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 that many biblical scholars believe that these disciples were anywhere between the ages of 14 up to maybe 28 years old, these disciples that Jesus chose. And so at a very young age, yet impressionable age, Jesus is trying to, to, to in the least uh, uh, mold and, and create a, a certain life within each and every one of these 12 that he has chosen. He He's not just concerned about the knowledge that they carry, Brother Jesse, uh, in so much as he is concerned with the personhood of what he's producing here. And i got to pause and just ask churches across the globe right now, what, what, what are we concerned with? Are, are we concerned with the knowledge that we are transposing and filling people's heads with? Or are we more concerned with the personhood of what we are producing in the church in this hour? Hour. I don't know about you, uh, Elder Parlor. I, I don't just want to know something. I want to be everything that God put me in this earth to be. And, and I understand that, that, that when God found me, he, there's some work that he, need, he needed to do on me. And there's probably some work that he still needs to do on me. And my prayer, uh, Sister Paula, is Lord, do the work quickly. Do the work quickly. As a matter of fact, I just want to pause and ask, is there anyone in this house, in this church, that will say, God, I don't mind you working on me. You're not dealing with a perfect vessel. You're not dealing, God, with a finished product. And Lord, I don't mind that you may be insinuating to me with what you're doing with me, that you're doing a work in me and you're changing me. As a matter of fact, if you're open to the Lord working, with you just give him praise let the Lord know let him know and let him know many of us many of us feel that we're a finished product and we're not we're not as a matter of fact the first words that the Apostle Peter ever spoke to Jesus were get away from me I'm not worthy I'm a sinner I'm a sinful man and I believe it's for this very reason that Jesus chose Simon Peter in order to be the type and shadow for us for what the church would be and the essence of what God is trying to do in each and every one of us. And so by the time we get to our text here, Jesus has been dealing with his disciples for a moment. And any time you are walking with the Lord and the Lord is dealing with you, one thing that you are going to come to understand, uh, uh, Pastor CJ, is that God does not do everything exactly the way that you would like him to do it. And so for those of you that, that came to church thinking that you're going to hear a message about God this week is going to figure out how to try to work with you. If you would just hold on because the Lord is coming your way, he's going to try to figure out how to make you happy and all your idiosyncrasies and the Lord's going to try to figure out how to work around you. This is not that, that, that kind of message, although I do want to remind you that the Lord is going to have his way with you. He's going to do his thing with you. He's going to do his thing, but the disciples were learning here by the time we get to Luke chapter number 18, that there is certain expectations that, 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 that he has of us. There are certain expectations. We see this just in the chapter prior. This is the story of the ten lepers in Luke chapter 17. And Jesus heals all ten. 
one comes back. Jesus asks, where are the other nine? In other words, I am observing more than just a moment's time in your interaction with me. For some of you, you need to know that God is doing more than just observing what you do while you're here in church. <laughs> the Lord is more interested in what you do after you get your word and your miracle in the house. Who are you after you depart from his presence? Is it a personhood that drives you back to him in order to tell him thank you? I wouldn't have any of this to begin with. Are you with me? Are you with me? So there is something that he expects from us in response to him choosing us. And in this, I believe that the disciples may have been arriving to a place amongst themselves that I've been at, that many of you as a believer, and I understand that most of you in here are believers. And to the unbeliever, I pray that today you allow the Lord to find you and you find him. But in dealing with with believers we go through seasons in our life where we feel like God is not responding to us the way let me say it like this especially according to the timetable that he that we feel like he ought to answer us uh, for some reason or another we as people have developed these different timetables with God within ourselves your timetable might not be my timetable, but I promise you that if you've walked with the Lord for any time at all, you have dealt with an internal timetable. You have dealt with enough time passing by that it begins to change your disposition. Suddenly things begin to come to the surface. And, 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 and where at once there, there, there might have been a, a certain expectation within your disposition, that uh, uh, an excitement that, that you know that God is going to do what he said that he promised he would do. Suddenly that turns into a God. Are you even who, uh, who you said? that you are and, and, and don't don't be ashamed if you've ever been through a season like that in your life and, and even if you might be there right now don't forget that John the Baptist the greatest of us all even sent his disciples to ask Jesus are you really the one that we talked about or am I supposed to be looking for someone else because we all go through seasons in our life where we say God did I have this thing wrong to begin with well you're the very one that I came to pick on today I came to have a conversation with you I came to sit down in your living room and remind you and enlighten you that God is not just going to show up but God is about to show up with some haste and with some power and God is about to deal with things in your life in a way that is unimaginable to you if you believe that then just take a second and let the let the Lord know that you believe it. Show forth some faith in this place. Show forth some faith. The writer himself, Dr. Luke, said, listen, the reason that he was sharing these parables he's about to share with us is to show us, to show these disciples that twofold, they should pray. And that they should never give up. That they should pray. And you should never give up. I, I wish that preaching to believers was that simple and that easy. Because really the answer to everything is you should pray. And you should never give up. You know, I, I, I almost just preached right here I almost just stopped there's so much that the Lord I, I knew wanted to share out of this but if there's anything if there's anything that you're going to remember out of anything I ever tell you not just today of any message you've ever heard me preach remember that that preacher just simply repeated Jesus and said to you you should pray and you should never ever give up and when I say give up I'm not talking about give up your prayer I'm talking about giving 
line up the driving force that produces that prayer up out of you to begin with. Because some of you in here are saying, it's not that I stopped praying, but your prayer changed because what you expected from him changed. And I came to encourage you to get your prayer back, get your hope back, get your expectation back, get your perception back that God is a God like nobody else. Can somebody in here get something back that produces a want to and a zeal in your belly, in your soul for what God has in store for you? Is there anybody in here that says, I want what God has for me? I want what he has for me. I want what he has for me. Say it again. My faith can be found. Say it again, I want what he has for me. This story is a story of perspectives in many ways. One perspective that Jesus immediately brings their attention to on purpose. And I have to believe that Jesus is addressing some problem areas within their collective paradigm here. And I'd like to do the same if I was talking to any church, not just Place for Life or if I was at Quest Church this morning in Norman, Oklahoma, or any pulpit I might find myself behind today. This would be a common thing that I would like to address, Pastor CJ. Because I feel like this collective paradigm can be found in far too many churches. Or let's say it like this, a misperception. The first thing that Jesus does is brings up this judge. In verse number two, Jesus says there was a judge in a certain city who neither feared God nor cared about the people. He didn't fear God or didn't care about people. He was a judge. He was a judge. Everyone say this, the judge's position. The judge's position. Jesus intentionally shows us, let me say it in modern day vernacular, there was a judge. And this particular judge didn't even care about people. And he didn't even fear God. In other words, I don't want you to consider the character of who he is. All I want you to do is consider the position that he holds. There was a judge who happened to be judged regardless of what you might have to say about his character or the personhood of who he is. There was a judge. Everyone say the judge's position. The judge's position. You know what too many believers forget, Pastor CJ, and I came to remind this house. People forget that God is God, and God is God all by himself. If there's one thing in pastoring that I've learned can just kind of just uh, rub me the wrong way a little bit, Elder Parlor, it's anxiety, unnecessary anxiousness from the everyday believer. And when I say the everyday believer, I'm talking about a real believer. I don't say that as a slight. I'm talking the, 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 a real believer, a real Christian. But, but even real believers and real Christians in this hour, Brother Jesse, seem to carry a certain amount of anxiety that I don't know about you, but to me conveys anxiety. And translates did you forget that God is God all by himself to begin with as nervous as you are about whatever condition it may be from your personal circumstance to the cultural condition of our day that kind of anxiety should not possess and entrap an everyday believer for the God that I serve carries a perfect love that casts out all fear. When you understand that God is God, then you understand 
that God is doing everything that he planned on doing and there is nothing to be scared of. Look at your neighbor and tell him you can get some sleep tonight because he's God all by himself. He's God all by himself. And this was a paradigm problem that Jesus is trying to deal with his disciples. Y'all getting worried about too much stuff. You're getting anxious about too many. You're asking too many questions. You're keeping a wrong kind of essence around what I'm trying to do. Would you take a breath and let me remind you that God is God all by himself. As a matter of fact, some of y'all need to forget about God today in relation to your problem. You need to forget about God in relation to anything because you can't relate God to anything. God is God all by himself. As a matter of fact, he spoke through the prophet Isaiah and he said, I am the Lord and there is no other apart from me. There is no God. I will strengthen you though you haven't even acknowledged me so that the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, men may know that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and I am God all by myself. I've learned that people that really believe that God is God all by himself are calm, cool, and collected people. They ain't nervous about nothing. They ain't upset about nothing. They ain't angry about nothing. They let offenses roll off of them easy. They walk softly. They hug deeply. They smile from ear to ear. They got a peace about them that cannot be shaken. If you got that kind of faith in this building, can you give God praise? Give God praise for the strength to keep your peace under trying circumstances. Give God praise for the ability to keep your joy. Even when everything in culture and the enemy's trying to throw everything they got at you, somebody in here kept their joy this week. You kept your hope this week. And I want to remind you that God is watching you. God has his eye on you. And he has gone all by himself. David said, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, you servants. Let the name of the Lord be praised, both now and forever from the rising of the sun to its setting. The name of the Lord has to be praised. Pastor Norris, the Lord is exalted over the nations his glory above the heavens who is like the Lord who is like our God who is like the Lord who sits enthroned on high who stoops down and looks over heaven and earth don't forget who you're serving he holds a position can't nobody else hold he holds an office no one else qualifies for he is God all by himself that's the God that you serve. You ain't serving a God that's trying to compete with your problems, that's trying to compete with your enemy. You ain't serving a God that has competition. God is God all by himself. Praise him for being God. He didn't step out of being God when you messed up. He was faithful even when we were faithless. He's the same, Mario. Yesterday, today, and forever. Same God, same God, same God. Look at somebody and tell them he's the same God. He's the same God that kept you and protected you when you was a baby and you didn't even know that something was watching over you. He's the same God that's covering you now. He's gone all by himself. Jesus said, don't forget this. Don't forget this. And of course, we can't get through this. We can't get through understanding this story, Sister Marie, without addressing this widow's persistence. As a matter of fact, in most of your Bibles, there's going to be a notation over Luke chapter number 18. In most of your Bibles. That even says that this is the story or the parable of the persistent widow. Now, Jesus didn't say that. Jesus said this is a story about a judge I want to tell you about. But the widow stands out so much, evidently, that whoever took our American English Bibles and, and tried to notate them for us decided to tell us, I know what Jesus said. 
but I'm going to tell you, it seems like this story is about a persistent widow. Needless to say, she stands out in the story. She stands out. She stands out in the story. She stands out. And, and that leads me to this point. I, I, how much do you stand out in your story with him? Oh, I, I, I know I just smacked somebody in their living room right now. But I need to know, if, if this story, Elder Whitley, were about you, if this story were about you, how much do you stand out in the story? Do you look like this in relation to where you fit in this story? Is this what Jesus could say about you? I had to ask myself that today. Is this what he would say about me? And I got to say at times, yeah, I want, I want to think that as of late, hey, I've been this right here. Oh, but I'm smart enough to know so many times in my life, Dory, I ain't been like this right here. Oh, but right now, right now, and, and I'm saying, Lord, I want to stay in this place that my faith can be found. My faith can be found in this, this, this widow's persistence we have to address because this is affecting the judge. It's affecting him. It's affecting him because someone in the story, and it ain't no secret who she is, understands who he is. <laughs> it's only affecting him because her behavior is reflecting her beliefs. That's what they say, isn't it? That modern day psychology teaches us that our beliefs are simply a reflect, our behaviors, excuse me, are simply a reflection of what we believe. So if you really believed it, have you ever wanted to ask someone, if you really believe that, then why are you acting this way? Uh -huh. We ask that because we're saying your behavior pattern don't line up with what you're saying you believe. And yes, if you're wondering, does Pastor D have a little bone to pick with the church? Yeah, and I'm part of the church. I'm just being a voice right now because I'm part of it too. But I got a bone to pick with all of us. Why don't we always behave like we believe? Why don't we always behave? He was only affected because someone in the story knew about his position. Let me say it like this. She knew who to go to. She knew that if anybody can change the circumstance that I'm dealing with, she was smart enough to know that if anybody can deal with my adversary in a just way, in the way I needed to be dealt with, it's this judge right here. It's the judge. It didn't matter that the judge didn't have character. It didn't matter to her that the judge didn't love God or he didn't like people. She was just smart enough to know he's the judge. It's amazing to me how sensitive we get with God. As believers, we ought to approach God with the same attitude. That in the least, we know at the end of the day, he's the only one that we can turn to anyway. What makes you think? that something has an answer for you that God does not have. Let me help you. God is God all by himself, and that's why you should go to him because he's the one that holds the position. God sits in the position that we should beckon. God sits in the position that we should beckon. We ought to cast our cares on him. Why? Because he cares for us. But secondly, because he can handle what we give him. As a matter of fact, Jesus Christ already proved when he hung himself on a cross that I can handle anything that you have to give me. And someone in here today needs to be free to approach God with whatever it is that you have. There is nothing about you that has put yourself in a position, nothing you've done. There's nothing concerning you that has placed you in a position that you cannot approach his throne room boldly. As the book of Hebrews tells us, and unabashedly knowing that God is ready to respond and to answer.
answer your prayers. Sometimes God is just waiting to see, do you have too much pride to get on your knees in your closet and say, I ain't picking up the phone. I ain't turning on the TV. I'm not getting on Facebook. The first thing I'm doing is getting on my knees. And Lord, I'm seeking you. I am going after you because you're the one in that position. She affected him because she realized that he's the one that can fix this. Don't get it twisted. Just because God has not dealt with some things for some of you yet does not mean that he cannot deal with those things. God can deal with whatever it is that he needs to deal with. There is nothing too great for him. Nothing too far for him. We know this. But we must be patient with him. We must, as the pastor James tells us in James chapter number one, we must allow perseverance. We've got to allow it to work. We have to allow it to work. Look at someone and tell them persevere, persevere. Persistence is continuing firmly or obstinately in a course of action in spite of difficulty or opposition. Persistence is continuing firmly or obstinately. Some of you have had somebody look at you recently and tell you you're just hard-headed about it. If it's something concerning the Lord, be hard-headed about it. Be obstinate about it. Oh, I could, I could really be a prophet in here and talk about how we are more obstinate when it comes to things like our last name or the color of our skin or the culture or the side of I could say we stand more obstinately with those perspectives than we do concerning spiritual ones. Mm -hmm. I could say that many of us are more obstinate concerning our earthly demographics than we are our spiritual demographics. But I want to remind you that our spiritual demographics obligate our disposition to reflect something. Look at somebody and tell them, continue, continue. Be obstinate. Be obstinate. James finishes his letter in James chapter 5. In verse number 7, I want you to just note this. Dear brothers and sisters, be patient as you wait for the Lord's return. Be patient as you wait for the Lord's return. Consider the farmers who wait patiently for the rains in the fall and in the spring. They eagerly look for the valuable harvest to ripen. You too must be patient. Take courage for the coming of the Lord is near. Don't grumble about each other, verse number 9 says. Brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. In other words, he's right there. Don't act like he ain't close by. Examples, for examples of patience and suffering, dear brothers and sisters, look at the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We give great honor to those who endure under suffering. For instance, you know about Job, a man of great endurance, and you can see how the Lord was kind to him at the end. For the Lord is full of tenderness and mercy. This word here, patience, in the book of James is a word that is more akin to persistence or perseverance. It is standing firmly. It is standing obstinately. If you're wondering, Pastor Dustin, what should I be persistent in? Some people say, you know what? I ain't going to quit. I'm never going to give up. But really all they're talking about is their nasty attitude. And their stank perspective. If we're going to be persistent, we got to be persistent in the right things. Everyone say keep on. Say keep on. Everyone say go on. Say go on. Everyone say hold on. 
These are the things to be persistent in. We keep on doing the things that we're supposed to do. This is why the writer of Galatians, the Apostle Paul, said in Galatians chapter number 6, to let us not grow weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we don't lose heart. We know that you are a perseverer. We know if you are persistent by your consistency. Persistency is reflected in consistency. Persistency is reflected in consistency. Look at the widow who came to the judge day after day. Not every now and then, not she came a couple days, took a week off, came one day, took a month off, came for a week, prayed for a day, took a week off, prayed for a week, then took two days off. No, she was consistent in her doing day after day after day after day. Ask yourself today, am I persistent? Am I persistent? If you want your answer, all you got to do is ask yourself, are you? you consistent? Are you consistent? Do you repeatedly go to the Lord with your burdens or do you only go to the Lord sometimes, Sister Susan? Be consistent and persistent. Look at somebody and tell them, keep on, keep on. Keep sowing, keep tithing, keep serving, keep praying, keep honoring, keep worshiping, keep on doing the things that you are supposed to do as a believer if this generation is missing anything, it is missing the persistency that gives way for the great and the good judge to respond. We ain't given the good judge anything to respond to yet because we have not been persistent enough with him. Being persistent means being the same. Why are you changing churches so much? Why are you changing your prayer up so much? Why are you changing your hopes so much? Can somebody in this hour stand up and be persistent and consistent with what God has given us? We go on. We persevere. The Apostle Paul said, I press on. I had an image of Samson grinding at that millstone, pushing that thing round and round, even though he was blind and had lost his strength. There was something about his persistency and his consistency that produced the greatest victory he had ever walked in. Too many of us are undervaluing what persistency is. Place the correct value on your persistency. This is what James said concerning the farmer. The farmer knew to value what he had placed in the ground even though he couldn't see it and no one else could see it. In other words, don't allow someone, Brother Dave, to put value on something that you know you're the only one that can really put value on. I might not be able to see the value of your prayers. I might not be able to see the value of your emotional and your psychological and your spiritual turmoil. I don't know what it costs you to get on your knees and to cry out to heaven. I don't know what kind of tax it's taken on you, but you know the kind of tax it's taken on you, and you're the only one that can stand and say there's value, and I know that if I'm patient with the Lord, the Lord is going to respond just like God responds every single time. Look at somebody and tell them, go on, go on, and tell them, hold on. Hold on to what God's given you and hold on to him. And then I'll close with this. It's already 11.56. Not only the judge's position. Yes, Brother Josiah, please come on in here with me. And I don't want you to just notice her perseverance. But I want you to notice the judge's disposition. Not just his position. Because Jesus addressed this thing called disposition later. He says, learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Learn a lesson from the unjust judge. There's something to be learned. Well, what is it, Jesus? Even he, even the unjust judge, rendered a decision in the end. First of all, your perseverance and your persistence always pays off. 
For some of you, you're wondering, is it going to pay off? Yes. Is my faithfulness. For some of you, you're saying it's becoming wearisome. I came to strengthen you today. For some of you, you're saying it's becoming mundane. I came to help uplift you today and breathe a fresh oil into you today. Because this is where the enemy stalls us and traps us, where things become mundane and wearisome. And these are the seasons that we actually grow in. These are the seasons that we are actually transformed in. These are the seasons wherein God does his greatest work in us. He said, learn a lesson. Don't you think that God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? In other words, not only is God God, but God is not the character of this judge. I want you now that you remember that God is God. Now that you remembered, you need to approach him as such. Now get soft here. Now get happy here. I feel like that's what he's saying. This is a reason for you to smile right here. I feel like what Jesus is saying. Jesus is not saying I'm getting on to you. Jesus is saying I'm giving you something that you should be encouraged with. And where you should be encouraged is all of this perseverance I'm preaching about is not worth nothing. It's not in vain. It's worth something. Because think about God. When you think about who God actually is, outside of being God, oh, he's a God that chose us. And he's a God that loves us. Think about his disposition. If that guy will respond like that, then certainly the God that we serve, most certainly. And he asked this question I noted earlier. Is God going to keep putting them off? Which answers a question that many of us have asked the Lord in this place today. Which is, God, are you putting me off right now? Are you purposefully not responding to me or answering me right now? And Jesus clearly is saying, yes. You will go through seasons with God where he will put you off. Jesus never said he won't put you off. As a matter of fact, he said, is he going to keep on doing it? Almost insinuating that there's a reason that he does it, Dory. Almost insinuating that there's a purpose behind him putting us off. Some of you feel put off today, and it's been on purpose. God has done it to get you to this point. For some of you, God's going to continue to do it until you give into his way and give into the work that the Lord is trying to do in you. This is what, the, this is what Jesus says. Is he going to keep putting them off? But I tell you, no. He's going to grant justice, and he's going to grant it quickly. It reminds me of what the Lord spoke to Jeremiah the prophet when the Lord told Jeremiah that not only am I going to send my word but I'm going to hasten my word to perform it in other words when I start to respond it ain't going to take me a long time to do what I need to do though it tarry it will not tarry is what the prophet Habakkuk told us but he said he's going to act speedily and then he ended with this question. He said, however, however, and we can all stand to our feet. We can all stand. He said, however, when the Son of Man comes, however, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith in, in you? Will he find faith on earth? What he was saying to them in this lesson is you've had your mind on the wrong perspective here. Yeah, he told them, you've been wondering, is God ever going to be who he said he's going to be? And really Jesus was turning around to ask the disciples, are you ever going to be what I'm expecting you to be? <laughs> because if you ever will, then I'm gonna do for you and I'm gonna do quickly 
everything that you know I'm capable of doing for you. This word is to encourage someone with every hand lifted, with every hand lifted. This word is to encourage you to pray harder. This word is to encourage you to live for him harder. This word is to encourage you to hope in him deeper. This word is to encourage you to have greater faith in him and act it out at a greater level. I want to bless you today and I want to encourage you with persistency. I want to bless you and I want to encourage you with perseverance today. To those in this place that have waned in your prayers, I speak to your belly and I speak to your soul. And I wake up the prayer inside of you. I pray that your mouth begin to open and you begin to pray like you've never prayed. I pray that you begin to approach the throne room of heaven like you've never approached him before. I pray that you begin to seek God like you've never sought him before. I pray that you begin to pray because you realize that in the prayer it's changing not just things, but it's changing the very essence of who you are. I pray against anything that would prohibit your perseverance and your praying. I pray against any distraction. I pray against anything in your schedule. I pray against anything in your emotions or your psyche or in your physical world that would try to convince you that you praying is not worth it. But I pray that you take time every week to focus solely on God alone and remember that he is God all by himself. I pray that you approach the throne room like it is really that, like it is really a throne room and like you pray to God like he is really the great judge and the judge that changes things. I pray that that man will drop in this place like never before. I pray persistence and perseverance. And now, God, I pray an answer, and I pray a hasty answer, a quick answer. Father, I pray that you answer quickly and that you do and perform your word quickly. Father, I thank you that when you begin to do the things that you plan on doing, Father, I see it in my life right now. And I pray that my life become an example over the next few months of time of how quick that you will do something and perform it when you've pasted your word on it. And I pray that as you do in me what I know that you are working on and working through. Father, I pray that you do the same for every house and every person under the sound of my voice as they persevere, as they stay persistent with you and their faith with you, in their hope in you, in their focus on you, that, Father, you respond and you answer prayers in the same way. For this we give you thanks. I pray against every curse, every distraction, every plan of the enemy that this week would hold. Father, we thank you that we're going to walk through this week in victory. In the name of Jesus, and the church said amen.